So previously, we've seen a couple of methods to detect motion from a static camera. That is, the camera is not moving. We've seen frame differencing, optical flow, dense optical flow, and motion, motion detection through background subtraction, which was probably the best of those. But unfortunately, when the camera is moving, those are not very good detection methods. So in this video, we're going to learn an unsupervised motion detection approach and we're going to code it from scratch in Python. So here's a video clip of the results, and you can see that we're able to detect motion for sufficiently fast moving objects in a scene where the camera is actually not entirely still. Even though the camera motion is small, it still makes this problem immensely challenging because even the smallest amount of motion causes these movers in this video to be lost in the noise. And we're going to find a way to bring these out of the noise, and you'll see how to code this in Python. So with that being said, let's get started. So here's an algorithm outline. So the first thing we do is we compute the key points on frame one. And to do that, we could use any kind of key point or corner detection. We're going to use the Shitomasi corner detector in OpenCV, which is implemented as good features to track. And next thing we do is we compute sparse optical flow from frame one to frame two. So what that looks like, is we take the key points from frame one and we do plot them on the second frame and here's what they look like. So here's all the key points for the strong features or corners that we've detected from frame one to frame two. The next thing we do is something called camera motion compensation is where we compute a rigid body transformation from frame one to frame two. So if we take the frame difference right here we have the difference of the original frames and the difference of the compensated frames. We could see that there's a lot less stuff coming out that, because we've actually compensated for the motion of the camera. So, and the next one is to take the norm of the compensated flow vectors, then perform outlier detection, and then to cluster the motion points and then filter the detected clusters. I know that sounds a lot right now, we're going to walk through it all. I also have an article that I'll link in the bio so you can read along if you'd rather do that. So I think once we get to go through this notebook, I think you'll have a better understanding of all of these. And we'll also recap these steps at the end and just to get a more in-depth understanding. So first thing we're going to do is our library import. Basically, notebook, OpenCV, NumPy, the key libraries, matplotlib. We also have our motion detection utils. So from that, we have our contour detections, um, our non-maximal suppression functions, all we're going to use. I have those detailed in, other video, in another video, the frame difference video. I'll also link that to be sure you can watch it to understand. But we're only going to work on the stuff that's new in this video. So the data comes from the VizDrone data set. I will link that in the bio. It's freely available to download. And here are the test images that we're using. Two sequential frames that we've loaded from the data set. So the first thing to do is perform motion compensation. So the, ba the basis for this is to take two sequential images, we convert them to grayscale, and then we compute features on the first frame. And we use the good features to track function, which is OpenCV's implementation of the Shi Tomasi corner detector. And we set a couple hyperparameters. Um, I find that these don't seem to matter too much as long as you have something decent, so you might not have to mess with these. And then the next thing we do is we essentially get the matching features on the next frame, and we use sparse optical flow for this. So we use Luke, OpenCV's version of Lucas Canande optical flow, and we take the previous frame with the current frame, along with the corners or key points that we've detected on the first frame. And this returns us the match corners and the status variable that basically says, hey, which corners are valid, which are not valid. So we could reshape these with the status variable to get the, you know, the valid and invalid ones. So these previous points and current points are the valid points returned by the Lucas Canande optical flow. So how this works, you basically get less. You're not going to match all of these corners with the optical flow function. So that's why we need the status variable to be returned. So the next thing we're going to do is get the rigid body transformation. So we'll go back to this in a second, but right here, here's the rigid body transformation. So what we want to do is we want to get a smaller amount of points. So right here, we are using the number of points is the number of features to attain on the images, but sometimes 
we might want to use less to perform the rigid body transformation. So this is going to do, it's going to take all these points from frame one right here to frame two right here, and it's going to compute a matrix rotation and translation, a two by three matrix that translates the points from frame one to frame two. And it's going to do it using the RANSAC, a RANSAC algorithm. Um, so we have two approaches right here. This is the one that I'm going to use in this video. It's called Estimated Fine 2D. It really only considers 2D space. We could also use Fine Homography. That seems to account for 3D space, but it doesn't seem to work as well. So to get the points used, we basically just take some random, randomly sample out of it and then put them as inputs to this function. So we return the rigid body or the transformation matrix, the previous points of frame one and the current points on frame two. So we have already ran this function called motion comp. We decide to use the same amount, 10,000 to 10,000. Doesn't really seem to overfit with 10,000. Maybe it's overkill, but maybe some testing would be better. And then we use the OpenCV function warp affine to perform the transformation if we do the homography transformation, we, we're going to use OpenCV's warp perspective function to do the homography transform. So here is what the transform function looks like. It's actually really hard to tell because the motion is so smooth. But if we look at the deltas, we could actually see we have a pretty good difference. We have um, everything seems to change here, but once we compensate for the motion, the noise levels go down significantly. And you can, can't really tell right here, but we have a moving car here, here, and here. And we have something else here that you can't tell. So we can't threshold this difference to get the movers. There's simply too much noise, background noise, that still wasn't taken care of by the motion compensation. And we can do, try an example here. So we have this mock threshold of 10. And we can see we get a lot of values here for these movers. There's a mover, here's a mover, here's a mover, here's a mover. What if we go to something like 50? You know, we knock down, we get some, you know, we get the mover still pop out a little bit, but it's not going to be good enough. So instead, we're going to leverage the compensated feature points that, that we have to find the moving objects. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to get the compensated points. So we have points on frame one and points on frame two, but we're going to project the points onto frame two using our affine transformation function, function rather than our optical flow. So that's going to be called our compensated points. I've already ran the cell, so I'm not going to run it again. And then just to get a overview of what they are, we have our previous key point of 528, our compensated point, is going to be 524 and our current point is 524 and you can do this with a couple of them there's going to be outliers and the and those outliers are actually going to be the movers that we seek to detect so we can maybe do this with 10 right here and see how this changes and you can see this looks like a it's a once again it's still a pretty close batch not as good as the previous one so the, the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to get our flow and compensated flow. So we just take current points minus previous points and current points minus compensated points. And now we compare the histograms. So what, the, what this is, is the motion of the points from frame one to frame two. And you can see in the vertical direction, we have a, the horizontal direction, we're pretty well spread out, we're kind of going crazy everywhere, the vertical direction we're actually moving the camera forward and up in the vertical direction. So this is why we're getting such a large one-way spread in the vertical direction. Now, once we compensate for it, we know that most of the objects in the scene are stationary, so they should mostly be centered around zero and with some outliers that are spread out around either side, which you really can't see right here, but they're plus or minus 30 on this right here. And the reason why they're not, we wouldn't expect them to be exactly zero is due to image noise and possibly camera vibrations that are going to force these pixels to not be the same from frame to frame or to be off by a couple. So that's why we actually do expect them to be, you know, a little bit around zero, but not exactly at zero. So the next thing we're going to do is obtain the outlier detection bound. So this comp is a temporary variable no longer used. So this is going to be 
something that we're going to do in two steps. So now we're going to take the norm of our compensated flow vector. So we're going to take the L2 norm of it. And we could also take the L L1 norm, but this is actually a good case for the L2 norm because the L2 norm is going to exasperate the outliers because of the squaring that the L2 norm does. We also have a tutable scale factor called that we call C. That's going to depend on how sensitive we want our outlier detection to be. And we also consider the kurtosis of our distribution. And I will talk about that a little bit lower. But our, but our bounds are basically a simple mean mu plus the standard deviation times c. So I've put us, I have some statistics here. I also have the L1 and L2 norm, but I really want to show you this right here. This is our L2 distribution of the compensated flow vectors. So the reason why we do the L2 norm is because we, it makes it easier for us to compare um, some sort of metric between both of these horizontal and vertical. We just want to see the total number of motion, total amount of motion that a single pixel goes rather than comparing two. We could compare two and possibly get better results. It would just be slower and possibly more challenging to work with. So that's why we use the norm. So we compute the mean and standard deviation to get some kind of threshold. It's gonna be right about here, you know, right where these outliers start. And something that we do is we consider the kurtosis. So the kurtosis is basically a, high, is basically a measure of tailedness of the distribution. And you can see this distribution has a long tail. We fit a Laplace, a Laplace distribution to this, which is a little bit outside the scope, but here's the Laplace function. And then we, we fit a B parameter to it. And then we just essentially plotted it at the same range. But basically, if we have a spiky distribution with a long tail, like we do here, we're gonna have a high kurtosis. But in the case that we get a small kurtosis, a value less than one, I find that lowering the scale factor by half is sufficient to give us a good, good um, sensitivity for our bound. So, so the next thing to do is to threshold against the upper bound, and then we find that we have 92 points to work with. And then now we could actually get our motion points by in indexing with our motion index that we've gotten from this threshold. So we could also basically plot the points on here and we see that this is what our first threshold has obtained. It has obtained this mover, this mover, this mover, and this mover, and everything else is an outlier or an incorrect threshold. And we especially see this on the edge. The edge points tend to move a lot more when the camera's moving. So the next thing we're going to do is cluster all of these points and then try to get rid of all these and try to mark these as background. So to do this, we're also going to add magnitude and angle to our values aside from the x or the x y motion, and this is going to give us four variables to cluster against. So we're going to use db scan clustering with an epsilon of 30 and a minimum samples of three. So the minimum samples is the minimum number of samples to be for a cluster to be considered valid, and then epsilon is the distance of pixels that the clusters need to be within each other. So if there's three points within 30 pixels, that would be considered a cluster. So we've obtained nine clusters here and everything in negative one is background. And now we could draw all the valid ones that are not background. So we can see we have one, two, three, and then three on the single mover right here. And then these are noise clusters. So the next thing we want to do is we want to filter out these noisy clusters and that's just a single cluster. So what we do here is we filter them based on angle and threshold. So the angle is the is going to be the angle where all the points are headed. So for a single cluster, for a real moving object, all of these points should be moving in the same angle. So we can measure their standard deviation, and it should be a very low value. If it's a high value, they're probably noise points, and they're moving in all kinds of different directions, and it's not going to be a valid cluster for our case. And the next one is the edge threshold. So empirically, points towards the edge are typically invalid. So we actually can set it to 50 or 20 or whatever and just get rid of the centroids or the cluster, the means of the clusters that are too close to the edge. And we do that with this loop right here. Um, the link to the code is in the bio. I'm not really going to walk through it. We basically index the cluster, take the standard deviation compared to the threshold. And if that's good, we compute the centroid. 
and if it's not within our edge threshold we add it to our cluster list and finally we can draw our clusters to do that we iterate through them we have our get color function which is in motion detection utils which gets a random color makes nice plots and then we plot points and this is what we get we get mover one two three and mover four actually has two clusters and the fact that it has two clusters is basically based on our pipeline So here is the overall code for the pipeline that has generated the video. We are going through the same thing. We choose a transform type. We perform motion compensation. We transform the key points right here. We compute the distance metric. We check the kurtosis. We get the upper bound. Remember this mean makes it one-sided. We obtain the motion points. We get the total motion data for clustering. We perform clustering. And then we filter the clusters. And then finally, we can return the clusters. So that's it.